Do you want to play the game where Rowan pays for therapy so everyone can benefit from the therapy? Oh, that's my favorite game. <laughs> you mean our therapist? <laughs> you did say that the other I day. I did. That, I that did say that the was other day. Very funny. <laughs> okay, so my therapist does this thing mm -hmm. every every session where she lists off all the things that are happening in my life. Huh. Yeah. Um like a laundry list, like mm -hmm. chores, uh, but in the past tense. And then afterwards, she looks me dead in the eyes and she goes, this is serious. Um, so that I can't squiggle out of it and be yeah. like, well, I overreacted or like, mm, everything is okay. Oh, um, I sent you the TikTok very intentionally of when you're going through something rough and someone's like, I'm so sorry. That's really difficult. And the person's like, ew, what? <laughs> the, the other version of someone going through something rough and someone just being like, ugh. Woof. And the other person being like, oh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Big yike. Big yike. <laughs> so uh, we have a new phrase. And by we, I mean she told me a new phrase. Um, and it's, is this a you thing or a what happened to you thing? Ooh. And if it's a me thing, I can like, sit with that for a while and we'll unpack it in therapy mm -hmm. and dig in there. But if it's a what happened to me thing, then I can just try and be like, Nah, I'm done with that. I don't need that. Yeah. It doesn't serve me anymore. Right. So <laughs> this is brought to you by Rowan's Therapist. <laughs> I wish everything was brought to us by Rowan's Therapist. She's actually a very cool lady who I think if I met her in real life, I'd be like, oh, you're still a really cool lady. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know? Because mm -hmm. you can't do therapy with with someone that you only kind of like contextually yeah it, it really helps to just have someone you can just sit down and be like yo listen things got real <laughs> weird last week let's talk about it let's break it down <laughs> i i was like hey what's the timeline on feelings with this and she was like what <laughs> oh my god that's so and I was like, funny I come from a no crying in baseball family, so I need to know how many innings in we are so I can figure out when I can have feelings about this. Are we seventh inning stretch? Is that a baseball term? Like, it is a baseball at? term. I'm more stuck on the, like, do you feel like you have to wait to have your feelings or do you feel like you only have a, a, a limited amount of time you're allowed to have feelings? C, all of the above. So you're both... Guilting yourself for feeling things already and then also feeling guilty because you feel like you're running out of time to feel feelings. Yes, the amount of guilt that I bestow upon myself is ridiculous yeah. for someone who was not raised uh, in a monotheistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who wasn't raised Irish Catholic like I was. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rowan Hall. A lot of guilt, no Irish Catholicism. Hi, I'm Tracy Harrison. Uh, some Irish Catholicism, yeah, also a lot of guilt. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Willing and Fable, the podcast that brings you original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. Each week, we research a topic from history or mythology, and then we write an original story to go along with that topic. So if you'd like to support the podcast, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash willingandfable. You should head over there and check out all of our fun bonus materials, like the Discord, and our custom art and custom stories. Another really fun way to support the podcast is getting on Facebook and uh, talking about us to all the people who are talking about Donald Trump. Uh, just replace all those conversations with us. I mean, maybe not those particular conversations. I don't know that those people would, like, love our vibe. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, people talking about, like, our flag means death or <laughs> the new oh, so hell of a boss stuff happening that's coming out. You know, like, that kind of stuff. Those people. You don't like think the MAGA folks want to see Achilles and Patroclus have a happy ending? They don't want to hear poetry from Sappho? I think they're missing out on a lot. I just don't know that we're the people to ease them into it, you know? <laughs> we're not an ease you in sort of podcast. We're not ease you in sort of people, to be honest. <laughs> You're not wrong. Also, 
if you want to support the podcast. Uh You can support your local lemonade stand and get a refreshing drink on a hot summer's day while supporting a small local business. But no matter what, we're glad you joined us for this episode. What's the going price on lemonade these days from a lemonade stand? I think it's like a dollar for one of those tiny little plastic cups, like tiny little plastic cups, like should be in your bathroom kind of plastic cups. Oh, like mouthwash? A little <laughs> bigger, a little bigger, but not much. <laughs> a shot of Minute Maid yes, lemonade? <laughs> yeah, I think it's like a dollar for a shot of lemonade. <laughs> That's so awesome. I... I mean, I don't live in a place with lemonade stands with kids. I was going to ask because I saw like three when I was driving yesterday. I Well, in Los Angeles, there's a lot of like fruit carts where you can get amazing fresh right. cut fruit with um, with lime. Mm. But those are businesses. Right. <laughs> those aren't children. But I would love to be one of the adults that rolls up. And drops a 20 on a shot of lemonade. I should keep cash in my car for that reason. I mean, probably not like 20s to just sling around, but you know, a couple of extra bucks here and there for the lemonade stands. Did you ever see the Twitter thread about the little girl who had a lemonade stand and her one of her parents was tweeting about how she made so much money? And the parents were like, what on earth? Like, we did not make that much lemonade for you. Yeah. And turns out the little girl would take the people's money and just not give them change and just say, thank you. Oh, my God. What a brilliant budding entrepreneur. What a budding capitalist. (laughs) The audacity. That's the audacity that little girl needs. That's the audacity we don't give little girls enough. I have so much respect. And as one of her parents, I would be like, uh... Great. Oh, my God. Okay. Sorry, Tracy. Yeah. Really quick. I have something I have to tell you. Okay. So a friend of Kaylee's and mine, who I just met in Pixel Circus, um, has a daughter. She's four, I think. Uh, and um, a little boy was bullying her and saying, like, you can't play with us. This is the boys' game. Mm. And she took her fist and just slowly held it up to the boy's face and didn't punch the boy or do anything she just without saying anything just slowly raised her fist up and held it in front of him and her dad came by and scooped her up and took her away like okay 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 and then he said to her i'm proud of you but we can't punch all the boys because they're stupid (laughs) so now okay all of us at various moments go, I'm proud of you, but we can't punch all the boys because they're stupid. Here's the thing. It doesn't sound like she's necessarily trying to punch all the boys because they're stupid. It does sound like she's looking just for the one. <laughs> so anyway, the last couple times a boy has been mean to one of my friends, we just go, I'm proud of you. You can't punch all the boys because they're stupid. Rowan, I'm proud of you. You can't punch all the boys because they're stupid. (laughs) (laughs) Should we jump into today's topic? What's the topic? Today we're going to talk about Elizabeth Friedman. So I will confess when Tracy presented this topic, I I did a who. I didn't know. Um, And she kindly gave me the log line so that I would know what to expect because she's a very gracious best friend. (laughs) That's so sweet. Uh, It wasn't a gracious thing, but... I found out about Elizabeth Friedman because when I can't sleep, I listen to documentaries. And so a few nights ago, I was falling asleep to a documentary about code breaking. And they had an episode on Elizabeth Friedman, who is an incredible woman that we're going to get into. Quick question. Yes. When you fall asleep to Mm -hmm. documentaries, does any of it imprint itself on your brain even a little My dream every time is that somehow as I'm sleeping, I'll still learn all the information when I wake up so smart, and it never happens. Good. Never. My brain is like, got it, understood, shutting it out, going to sleep, no learning while we're sleeping. Okay, but hear me out. That happens when I'm awake. (laughs) All right. Teach me a thing. I'm awake. Teach me a thing. Since we're all awake, except for those of you who put our podcast on in order to fall asleep... Uh, maybe you will get this by osmosis while you're sleeping. If you do that, could you message us? Yeah. I feel like that'd be such a good compliment. It's the best compliment. 
Because, like, I only fall asleep to things that I find comforting and interesting. Like, I have to find it both comforting and interesting in order for it to help lull me to sleep. Please reach out. Please, please. Willingandfable at gmail.com or any of our social media handles, Willing and Fable. But now it's time to dive into the life of Elizabeth Friedman, which starts out in 1920s America. So, Rowan, 1920s in America was a period of rapid change and a time of constant contradiction. Morality was seen as more important than ever, but the flapper with her short skirts and fun (laughs) personality was the, quote, new woman of the era. Alcohol was banned across the country, and yet the demand for it was higher than ever. Women were finally able to stand on their own without a husband, yet getting a husband was often the top goal for many women. Despite increasing opportunities in employment and education and the expanding concept of a woman's place, marriage did remain the aim of most young women. Magazine articles and movies encouraged women to believe that their economic security and social status depended on a successful marriage. The majority of women worked only until they married. However, there was beginning to be a newfound freedom for women. Today, the easily recognized image of the flapper symbolizes the 1920s. The flapper with her short skirts, at least short for the time. How short were they? (laughs) So unlike the Halloween costumes that you see with the flapper skirt at like the thighs, these did fall just below the knees, though as um, there were some movements with dancing, you could see the knees, which is where the term rouge your knees came from. People would actually put blush or even at, for a very, very short couple of years, painted designs mm-hmm. on their knees so that when they were dancing, it was like a fun fashion element. So Tracy already knows this, but for a senior prom I went to, my close friend's senior prom, I wore a vintage Mm-hmm. from the period flapper dress yep. and it was cut just above the knee and the guy who i got it from who was a costume he formerly worked in hollywood as a costume designer um, yeah. but he was like this dress was scandalous like wearing this dress out was like you know when you go out to a club and you're like i am wearing mostly no clothes mm-hmm. um, kind of energy mm-hmm. so really quick tracy i know that you know, normally everyone's like, oh, I was on the Titanic and now I'm reincarnated. Like, everyone's always yeah. like, I'm formerly Cleopatra, like, kind of thing. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So we know that we would have been low economic status, probably working in a factory, not participating. But I I, I will not give up imagining myself as a flapper. Uh, you have very strong, like, Daisy Great Gatsby energy. You really do have that vibe. Thank you, but yeah. I think we're not addressing your bob haircut. The bob haircut I had in middle school when someone one time said, you had up the uh, body and kind of vibe of someone who could pull off a 20s aesthetic. And 13-year-old me was like, great, that is my entire personality for a few years. Thank you. Yeah, there were a lot of hats during that period. Oh, my God, there were. Okay, so back to... 1920s. Uh, We have the flapper. She's got short hair, noticeable makeup, a fun-loving attitude, and she represented new freedom for women in America. The old restrictions on dress and behavior were being overthrown more and more each day. Highly publicized flappers shortened their skirts, drank illegal alcohol, smoked cigarettes, and otherwise defied society's expectations of proper conduct for a young woman. So is this glamorous and rebellious image of the flapper a true representation of the 1920s woman? No. (laughs) No, not entirely. In order to be a flapper, a woman had to have enough money and free time to play the part. College girls, unmarried girls living at home, independent office workers most frequently presented themselves as flappers, while many other women in society, especially women of color, did not have the means to do so. It's always about wealth. It's always about wealth. That's like the whole thing of Great Gatsby. Everything that's ever in vogue, ever, is always about wealth. Full stop. Yeah. Many women of the day worked various jobs across all industries or found themselves married with motherhood as their primary job. And it was in one of these jobs that a young woman from Huntington, Indiana, would begin a journey that changed the course of history. 
Born in 1892 to Quaker parents, John and Sophia Smith, Elizabeth was the youngest of nine children and grew up on her family's farm. Her name has a unique spelling, E L I Z E B E T H. <laughs> this is because her mother hated the nickname Eliza, so she changed the A to an E, eliminating the possibility of that nickname for her daughter. I don't think that that accomplished that. Right, because people would have to see the spelling first. I'm Elizabeth Triple E. You can't shorten it to Eliza. <laughs> Triple E Elizabeth. Can you imagine going to Starbucks and saying I'm Elizabeth with three E's and you just get E E E L I C A B E T H? <laughs> I, I do like it for her, actually. It took me a while to figure out because some places just spell it wrong with the A, the classic Elizabeth spelling, but most places don't. So I was getting really confused until I found that fact that her mother hated the nickname Eliza and thus her name was spelled differently. And thus she became Elizabeth Triple E. So from 1911 to 1913, Elizabeth attended Wooster College but left when her mother became ill. Later, she attended Hillside College in Michigan where she began to realize her affinity for languages. She graduated with a degree in English literature, but spent much of her time focused on studying Latin, Greek, and German. Elizabeth began working at Riverbank Laboratories in Geneva, Illinois, in 1916. It was one of the first facilities in the U.S. founded to study cryptography. What is cryptography, Tracy? I mean, no one at me. I do know what it is, but, like, we are a podcast. <laughs> That's no, that's a good question. So cryptography is the uh, study of breaking codes. So everything from ancient codes from a Sumerian text trying to decode the language to breaking ciphers for the way that you think spies would use them to today using cryptography for encryption and decryption. So it's uh, intentionally obscuring the original message so that it cannot be read by others without the way to break the code. If you're thinking of cryptids, though, good on you. If you're thinking of cryptocurrency, bummer. So imagine if you were a cryptographer, a cryptid cryptographer researching cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency cryptid cryptographer, Tracy? Oh, okay. Okay, 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 okay. I want to get crypt. Just mm -hmm. crypt. Just classic crypt. Okay, they're working in there. crypt. Uh huh. And. Okay, so then it would be a crypt crypto cryptid cryptographer. Ooh, I did it on the first one. Okay. And then just to be fun, silly, goofy, yeah. I want to get cartographer in there. Yeah. Okay, so it's a crypt crypto cryptid cryptographer cartographer. Mm, cartography cryptographer? Crypt. Crypto, yeah. cryptid, yeah. cartographer, cryptographer. Everyone else um, feeling good? Feeling <laughs> feeling like this is making sense? I, Have I we melted your brain? <laughs> I, think, I think it broke my brain. Um, it's dead people, money, monster, map, code. I can't <laughs> wait for that to be our next merch. <laughs> dead people, money, monster, Monster Death, Mash Code? Death, Money, Monster, Map, Code. <laughs> Death, Money, Monster, Map, Code. Like one of those where it's got the names listed in no other context. <laughs> it's just Death, Money, Monster, Map, Code. Crypt, Crypto, Cryptid, Cartography, Cryptographer. <laughs> Crypt, Crypto, Cryptography, Cartographer. Anyway, back to Elizabeth Friedman. The next person in our story is Colonel George Fabian, who was a wealthy textile merchant. He owned Riverbank Laboratories, and he was very, very interested in Shakespeare. Elizabeth was looking for a job, and she visited Chicago's Newberry Library, where she talked to a librarian who knew of Fabian's interest. The librarian called Fabian, who appeared in his limousine, and invited Elizabeth <laughs> to spend a night at Riverbank where they discussed what life would be like at Fabian's great estate located in Geneva, Illinois. He's interested in her. They never get into it. They never hint at that. But, like, he sent a limo to pick her up for dinner. 
It's a, well, since we're in the 1920s, uh, it's a Gatsby move. Well, I mean, sort of in the 1920s. It's, he's pulling a Gatsby. He's like, oh, look at my fancy car and my big house. I am curious to dig into this more because you'll see he does something later on that's kind of shady. But she doesn't end up with this guy. So cool. it gets more complicated. So Fabian, Colonel George Fabian, who owned this Riverbank Laboratories, subscribed to a very specific theory that he was hoping to prove true once and for all. He believed that William Shakespeare was not the man who wrote the famous plays. Instead, they were written by Sir Francis Bacon, and only those clever enough to decipher the clues within the text would learn the truth. No! <laughs> Shut yeah. up, Fabian! Mm -hmm. Just no! <clears throat> People really like to say Sir Francis Bacon did a lot, and he did do a lot, but like, come on. People also really love to get up on their high horse about how no one man could possibly write so many groundbreaking plays. And I'm sitting here like, one, first of all, Stephen King is around and he's just churning out a, a book that turns into a movie every other year. Brandon Sanderson writes like a book when he breathes near a computer. Guyman, Pratchett, mm -hmm. men that write. And also you're showing a fundamental lack of understanding of how the theater worked, especially at that time. It was very collaborative. So yes, his name got to be on it, but he had an entire theater company's worth of brains working with him. Anyway, Tracy, code breaking. Yes, we'll have to do a whole episode on Shakespeare and that whole theory. We have to. That's going to be one that you guys to cover. Sorry, I went to theater school. <laughs> but Fabian proposed that Elizabeth would assist a Boston woman named Wells Gallup, fantastic name, and her sister in their attempt to prove once and for all that Sir Francis Bacon had written Shakespeare's plays and sonnets. The work these women did would involve decrypting and ciphered messages that were supposed to have been contained within the plays and poems. However, Despite a valiant attempt at finding the answer Fabian was seeking, Elizabeth and her co-workers found no proof of this theory. I'm shocked. So another good thing happened for Elizabeth during this time. She met fellow cryptographer and botanist William F. Friedman. The two would marry in 1917 and continue working together. According to a biography about Elizabeth titled The Woman Who Smashed Codes by Jason Fagan, Jason Fagan is an author I will be referencing a lot throughout this episode. He says, quote, Friedman was his wife's biggest champion, and she in turn cared for him through his struggles with depression. But the fact that Elizabeth was married to the man who famously broke the World War II Japanese cipher machine purple is one possible reason she wasn't given the recognition she deserved, end quote. <sighs> So I have a picture here, Rowan, of William and Elizabeth Friedman having recently been married while at Riverbank in 1917, and below oh. it, one of them many, many years later. Oh! <laughs> oh, my whole heart. Okay. So the first one, where they're young, just married little whippersnappers, uh, it is pre-1920s, and the fashion shows that. It does. Um, his tie only goes down halfway, and it is thick. It is. It's basically a diamond yeah and he's got the parted in the middle hair with the little slick swirlies mm -hmm. and she has the hair that is in that phase where everyone was transitioning from loving the gibson girl still into the flapper mm -hmm. uh, influence that middle period and she's wearing a dress with a high waist like a mm, empire way mid waist yeah. and a big wide collar and it's got lace and his jacket is that kind of um the jacket you always see one of the royals wearing when they're going out hunting with their dogs oh uh, yeah that's a good way to put it actually <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you describe this of the same couple but about 30 40 years in the future okay so they're a little stoic in the first one obviously it's 1917 the next one, no, oh, they look so in love. Um, okay, they're so, so they're cute. I love these two so much. They love each other so much, and no one believed in the other one more than the other one of them. Like they loved and believed in each other. Ugh. you know they're they're much older in this photo, and they have that way of having aged that shows that they 
are happy and lived a happy, mm-hmm. good life mm-hmm. um, up until this point. And they're in an office or a library, something. And out on the table, there's what well, looks like could be a book or something that has lots of photos. I'm imagining it's showing their work. I believe a- that's what it is. I believe this was a, them at a showcasing of the, some of the things that they had, some of the codes they had broken throughout the years. There's a, a code machine thing next to him he's got a bow tie on same stripes as the original tie it does have the same stripes got classic tortoiseshell glasses in his hand nice suit cute bald man and then she's just smiling they're both smiling at someone off camera they're not like holding hands but they're really close mm. they look so in love also she's got a lot of kind of very costumey jewelry on and i really like that it's that very 50s bling she just has this spark of like intelligence and authority in her face in the later picture that she doesn't have in the early one like the early one she seems a little bit more subdued a little bit Mm -hmm. just like sweet and young and in this later one you can tell she's a woman who got used to commanding a room i bet she's fun i bet she drinks gin and tonics and plays a mean game of canasta oh yeah oh you know you could never beat this woman at a card game you just know it absolutely not no absolutely not (laughs) So even as Riverbank gathered historical information on secret writing, military cryptography had begun to become de-emphasized after the Civil War. It was downplayed to the point where there were only three or four people in the entire United States who knew anything about the subject. Two of those people were Elizabeth and William Friedman. This means that when the United States entered World War I, Fabian established a new Riverbank Department of Ciphers with the freedmen's in charge, and he offered their services to the government. That's a really interesting thing to have happened. And actually, to kind of contextualize it, uh, doctors are concerned right now with the overturning of Roe v. Wade that abortion will not be taught to doctors, and we will face a period where there is a whole class of doctors who are not able to give abortions because it is... Well, not de-emphasized, but made illegal in this scenario. But when you do that or you de-emphasize, suddenly no one has these skills and then you need them. Yeah. It's a really scary prospect and it's something that happened here. So because they were two of four people in the entire country who could do cryptography, they ended up working together for the next four years in the only cryptographic facility in the country. According to History.net, In 1917, when Congress declared war, America had no intelligence community. Only five or six people in the entire country knew anything about code breaking, and Elizabeth and William, both in their 20s, were two of them. George Fabian (laughs) offered their services to the U.S. government. William eventually served in France. Elizabeth spent the war solving intercepted German and Mexican messages sent to her by mail from Washington, D.C., Eventually, the two transferred to Washington, D.C. in 1921. In fact, they would have done so sooner, but their boss Fabian, in an attempt to control the couple, hid their mail, (gasps) causing a fracture in the relationship between the Freedmans and Fabian. He hid their mail so they didn't know that they would be able to transfer to Washington, D.C. Fabian, no. I know. I wonder if it was because he didn't want to lose such a powerful asset that he had over the government, or if there was something else going on. I'm, I mean, I cannot speculate that he had any feelings towards Elizabeth. That's just, there's no evidence for that. But that is very weird behavior, and it's very controlling behavior. He had some type of strong feelings about them, even if it was only based in financial interest. The odd... Sir! I know. <sighs> After World War One ended... Elizabeth Friedman thought, okay, she would stay home and write children's books. She'd (laughs) always had an interest in linguistics and English literature. She'd given birth to two children in the 1920s, a girl and then a boy. However, despite her desire for a quiet and peaceful life, government agents kept showing up at her doorstep, asking her to break codes for various departments. She found the only way to make them go away was to say yes. So in 1925, she went to work for the Treasury Department, which was trying to enforce prohibition. In fact, she was so needed that when they asked her to work, she said, I'm going to work from home. And that wasn't a thing. 
in the 1920s. And that's why earlier I mentioned they mailed her ciphers to decode because she refused to go travel and work in an office when she had to raise the children. So they actually allowed her to solve the ciphers from home. Yeah, being one of only four people in the country, you have a little bit of leverage. Little bit, yes. So I mentioned prohibition. So now let's switch over and talk about prohibition and Al Capone. <laughs> Al Scarface Capone was born on January 17th, 1899. He would grow up to become one of the most notorious American gangsters of his time. He most famously gained notoriety during the Prohibition era as the co-founder and boss of the Chicago Outfit. The Chicago Outfit is an Italian-American crime family based, obviously, in Chicago, and it dates back to the 1910s. It's part of the larger Italian-American mafia that originated in the south side of Chicago. The outfit rose to power in the 1920s under the control of Johnny Torrio and Al Capone, and the period was marked by bloody gang wars for control of the distribution of illegal alcohol during Prohibition. For those who may not know, Prohibition was a time in the United States when there was a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol beverages. This lasted from 1920 to 1933. Note that it did not prohibit the act of drinking alcohol, a loophole many would exploit over these years. America was just like, no, we don't want to tax this thing that everybody wants. We don't want that money. How silly. America would never ban a thing they could make a lot of money from that a lot of people find enjoyment out of. They would never do that. I hadn't really considered the fact that the Chicago outfit basically had a decade to set themselves up before Prohibition, which is mm -hmm. probably a big reason why they were able to become so powerful so quickly when other organizations sprang up because of Prohibition. I think that makes a lot of sense. I would love to dig in further and do another episode fully focusing on Al Capone and the Chicago outfit, but the best I could do was give you context for today's episode. Thanks. During this time period, gang violence exploded in Chicago with figures like Al Capone at the head of these incredibly powerful crime families. They would employ bootleggers or rum runners to sneak alcohol and other illegal substances into the country by land or sea. The Coast Guard took on a big portion of this work, and since the smugglers used encrypted radio messages extensively to conduct their operations... They hired Elizabeth Friedman to break the codes. She decided to quit her job in 1922 on a temporary basis to decode their backlog of messages. In the beginning, the codes were relatively simple to break, but even as they got more and more and more complex, Elizabeth Friedman was always able to break them. In October and November of 1929, Elizabeth was recruited to solve 650 smuggling traffic cases in Houston, Texas that had been subpoenaed by the United States Attorney. In doing so, she decrypted 24 different coding systems used by the smugglers. Friedman's work was responsible for providing decoded information that resulted in the conviction of the narcotic smuggling Ezra brothers. While working for the U.S. Coast Guard, the Bureau of Narcotics, the Bureau of International Revenue, the Bureau of Prohibition and Customs, and the Department of Justice, Friedman solved over 12,000 coded messages by hand in three years. This resulted in 650 criminal prosecutions. Remember, this is the 1920s and 30s. She did all of this by hand with nothing more complex than a pencil and some paper. Did anyone know she was involved in this outside of the people she worked with? Because I would think that that would put a target on her back. That is a great question, Rowan, and it leads really perfectly into my next segment. So, oh, Are you kidding me? It, yeah, it really perfectly does. <laughs> <laughs> so her work in these cases made her directly responsible for helping to arrest and try Al Capone. <laughs> but she couldn't make a big show of what she'd accomplished – because it was dangerous to reveal her part in the capture of one of the most notorious crime bosses of the 1920s. Snitches get stitches. Snitches get stitches. And she wasn't necessarily a snitch, but like, you know, the girl who breaks your code gets <laughs> stitches. It doesn't flow as well. But <laughs> despite this danger, 
she did appear as an expert witness in 33 cases. Ooh. This led to a newspaper article about her becoming famous all across the country, and many people began to know the name Elizabeth Friedman. The Mob Museum describes her time as an expert witness, writing, quote, while in court, Friedman used a blackboard to explain to the jury how <laughs> cryptologists translated codes into plain language. She read a sample message referring to a brand of whiskey. Out of old kernel in pints. She showed how the three O and L letters in kernel had identical cipher code letters. From the cipher's letters for kernel, she could figure out the letters the racketeers chose for E the most frequently occurring letter in the English language. Based on other brand names of liquor they mentioned in other messages, the O and L letters in alcohol, she said, had the same ciphers as Colonel. This tactic worked. Morrison and his indicted cohorts were found guilty and sentenced to long stretches in prison. Friedman later recalled... Quote, if I remember rightly, this was the only case against smugglers where my work was instrumental in bringing the indictments against Burt Morrison and his 22 co-defendants. So to make a little bit of sense of that, basically, Elizabeth approached code breaking from a very linguistic perspective. Knowing that E is the most frequently used letter in the alphabet, if she can figure out the letter for E in the code, it helps her figure out the other letters. So she was able to figure out the first word, break down the other letters in there, and from there just break it apart. It, it is so mind-boggling how she does it, but it is all from a linguistic perspective where her husband took it from a much more analytical perspective, which is why they were known as such a powerhouse couple, because when they worked together, they solved things the other one wouldn't have noticed. Imagine being at that trial, though, as a member of the mob who's not about to go to the clink um, <laughs> and saying to yourself i'm never using the letter e again yeah right <laughs> and you have to now figure out how to send messages without the letter e she didn't even need the letter e necessarily she solved it first with o and l so i think it's safe to say just no vowels <laughs> tech speak yeah. was invented <laughs> so that the mob could avoid elizabeth friedman mm -hmm. fun fact <laughs> tech speak was invented Specifically to spite Elizabeth Friedman. Uh, lol was off the table for them, though, by virtue of the O's and the L's. <laughs> okay, so you're ready for the original story I wrote for this week? Oh, yeah. Okay. I remember the trial like it was yesterday. It took place in the middle of July in the midst of a heat wave. This meant the courtroom was packed full of hot, sweaty bodies all clamoring to get a glimpse of the proceedings. Men in suits dotted with sweat stains and women desperately fanning themselves with small handbags were all packed together like sardines in a can. I was pressed firmly against my mother in the middle of a row, the wood of the bench pressing into my back and leaving what I knew would be a sweat stain on my new blouse. Oh, my mother would not be happy with that. But we were here because my cousin was on trial as part of Al Capone's gang. He was eight years older than me and never showed any interest in hanging out with his younger cousins. But for some reason, our family insisted we all show up in support. And if the size of the crowd inside and outside the courtroom was any indication, we weren't the only family who had the same idea. My cousin wasn't a major player in the outfit, so we were all hoping he would get off fairly easy. It didn't help his case that he spent the last six months running around Chicago loudly announcing to anyone who would listen that he was in with Al Capone. Men could be such idiots sometimes. I knew it when I was 14, and I still know it now. They announced who the next witness would be, a cryptographer who supposedly broke the code the gang had been using to coordinate smuggling alcohol into the city. My jaw nearly dropped to the floor when a woman in a neatly pressed skirt and blouse took the stand. A woman was the witness? A woman was the codebreaker? I had never heard of such a thing before in my life. I hadn't even realized I was straining to see her better until my mother pushed me back into my seat with a word of reprimand, but I didn't care. I was fascinated. 
She spoke with such confidence and held herself with such poise. I couldn't take my eyes off this woman even if I wanted to. She looked the male judge, the male lawyers, and every man in that room straight in the eye and told them how she outsmarted the most notorious gangster in all of America. That day, Elizabeth Friedman changed my life and showed me that a woman could be more than I ever imagined. She inspired me to pursue my academic dreams when no one else around me did. And she had no idea. She will never know what an impact she made on me that day in a sweltering hot courtroom in the middle of a Chicago summer. But I will never forget. Okay, so because I know you, I know that this is slightly more of a self-insert <laughs> than it may normally be. Mm -hmm. You you just somehow really captured in very simple but impactful language how thrilling it can be to see yourself represented in a way that you never thought of before. Because this young woman is seeing a woman doing something she hadn't considered could be done. Yeah. And th having that moment feels so profound and yet so simple at the same time. And I think you really hit that pocket. Thank you. I wanted it to, to feel like that moment where you see doors opening in front of you. And and really emphasize the importance of seeing representation of yourself. And the, a big part of my life is trying to show younger women and younger girls that they can be in technology and that it's okay. And that's, I think, a lot of where the energy of this came from. I, I just imagine there has to be someone out there who saw Elizabeth Friedman living her life and was inspired by it. You did a really clever thing in establishing how hot and muggy the courtroom <laughs> was. By the way, rude. Um, yeah. And then making Elizabeth's presence almost like a literal breath of fresh air. Yes. In that space. That was really, really well executed. Thank you. I, thank you. I'm glad you caught that. I wanted her to feel like this almost mythological figure unfazed by the things affecting everyone else because when you're a pioneer in a space like that you kind of have to be you know she can't be impacted by the things that impact other people because she has to be better than them when you did that i was like bopping my head along <laughs> like a good song i was like yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's move on to her work fighting the nazis heck yeah yeah so let's fast forward. It's 1930. Elizabeth Friedman proposed creating a team of seven people to handle the increasing workload involved in decrypting messages. Her proposal was finally approved in 1931, and she was put in charge of the only code-breaking unit in America ever to be managed by a woman. Oh. We love to see it. I don't know why I'm so surprised that she got to be in charge. That's awesome. I know. Well, again, when you have so much expertise, they're kind of at a point now where they have to treat her, quote unquote, like a man, you know, get the same level of respect because no one else is going to step in and do it. She knows too much. <laughs> too much. But we'll see how things kind of shift for her. So as World War II broke out, her role as a code breaker would become even more important to the government. Elizabeth and her husband were once again pulled into the fray as expert codebreakers at the start of World War II. Elizabeth was assigned to monitor clandestine communications between German operatives in South America and their overseers in Berlin, yet she did not have the kind of control she was used to. This was due to the fact that her unit, which she had been running for years at this point, was transferred to Navy control, which did not allow for civilians to be in charge of a unit. Butler Greenfield, a historian working on her story, says that, quote, she had to take orders from a male officer who she felt, partly for career reasons, wanted to make South America a career story, end quote. Elizabeth was also irritated by the sloppiness of the FBI interfering in her code-breaking work and felt that the agency had always looked at her with disdain and in a sexist light. However, they still demanded her help because of how indispensable her talents were. 
She realized it was a continuation of how she'd been treated for much of her career, and she was always fixing messes men had created or solving problems they could not solve with little to no credit for her work. Through her work during World War II, Elizabeth Friedman decrypted messages that had been sent using the infamous German Enigma machines. Oh, the Benedict Cumberbatch machine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Turing, Alan Turing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a monster. <laughs> As soon as Benedict Cumberbatch plays someone, uh, it's over. It's over. Yeah, yeah. It just becomes the Benedict Cumberbatch character. She also worked on that, and she was able to to decipher some of those codes. She uncovered an entire spy network across South America <gasps> and discovered the identity, code names, and codes of its ringmaster, Johannes Siegfried Becker. That's so cool. Yes. Get ready. It gets even cooler. Journalist Jason Fagan writes that, quote, Elizabeth was his nemesis. She successfully tracked him where every other law enforcement agency and intelligence agencies failed. She did what the FBI could not do, end quote. Mm, imagine getting to be someone's nemesis. I know, I know. I. She's so cool. She's the suburban <sighs> housewife mom who has a nemesis? A spy nemesis? <sighs> New... A goal unlocked. Truly. Notably, after the spy ring was crushed, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile definitively broke with the Axis powers and sided with the Allied powers, eliminating the threat that the Western Hemisphere would fall. So I'm not saying she is solely the reason for that, but... Sounds like you're saying that. It's important to note. Sounds like that's what you just said. I, it, it sounds like it definitely played a part. Get yourself a nemesis. Get rid of the Nazis. <laughs> Step one, get a nemesis. Step two, get rid of the Nazis. Step three, <laughs> profit? <laughs> Death, money, monsters. <laughs> All right, so get ready to get kind of angry. Oh. Despite having decrypted <laughs> thousands, and I mean thousands of codes, stopped literal Nazis and put Al Capone behind bars, Elizabeth Friedman never got the recognition she deserved. <sighs> In fact, the credit for her work was stolen by, and Rowan, you're going to hate this, none other than J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover ruins everything! <laughs> for those who don't know, Rowan has a particular <laughs> hatred for J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> he gets very angry when he gets brought up. How did I not know? He well, you didn't know because he just went, oh, actually, the FBI led the code-breaking operations, and then he just erased any of the credit that Friedman would have gotten, and they made her sign a Navy oath promising her silence until her death, which, because she's an amazing woman, she kept that promise until she passed away in 1980. <sighs> and the history books all just wrote down, yeah, it was Hoover. Hoover was the one who broke the codes when really it was Elizabeth. And... Time Magazine, in an article about Elizabeth, reports that in a 1956 profile on her husband, William <gasps> Friedman, Time themselves listed his lofty honors and awards for his contributions to break the cipher of the purple machine, and they themselves referred to Elizabeth as an assistant cipher clerk. No, they secretaried her. Yes, they did. Yes, they <gasps> did. So then, you know, 30, 40, 50, whatever years later, I think it was 50 years later when they wrote this article, maybe even 60. They're like, actually, here's all the stuff about Elizabeth. She was great. She was amazing. We messed up 50 years ago. But even they just said assistant cipher clerk. Oh, that Ooh. Okay, so there's some debate. I guess there could be debate. Whatever. If J. Edgar Hoover could have just like Gone off and married a man. I think that would have solved so many issues. <sighs> I would have loved to see it. I think that would have been great for him. Again, historical evidence could be argued, but I I love to imagine him having a sweet little queer life and not being an absolute piece of garbage yes. every time he appears in the history books. <laughs> yes, I think that would be great. I think we're all in agreement on that. Assistant Cypher Clerk. It made, me so, it made me so upset to see. And you see a ton of articles coming out and there's famous documentaries coming out now about Elizabeth that's trying to give her her, you know, time in the spotlight. But it's just, can you imagine how it must have felt for her to be 
as good at, if not better than her husband at solving ciphers, working constantly together. He supported her all the time, but then to just have to stay silent and never get credit and everyone sort of just pat you on the head as a helpful little young lady. Okay. I like to think that she had such a wonderful life with her husband that there was somehow a fair deal in that. I Listen, straws were grasping. But still, you know, I, I hope for her sake that her life was so good yeah. that she was too busy being happy. But people do this all the time with famous artists. Like, oh, they didn't sell any paintings in their lifetime and they were starving and had a really hard life. But look. Look how famous they got when they're dead. Yeah. Look, wouldn't they be so happy to see this? And I'm like, wouldn't they be so happy to have made money off of their art in their lifetime when they could have benefited from it? Mm-hmm. Buy art from living artists and give credit to living people. Agreed. That, yeah, if we had one tagline for the show, well, we couldn't possibly oh, have just oh, one. but there are so many. There are so many. <laughs> Assistant Cypher Clerk. Assistant Cypher Clerk. So let's talk about her posthumous recognition. After retirement from government service, Elizabeth and her husband, who had both long been Shakespeare enthusiasts, collaborated on a manuscript titled The Cryptologist Looks at Shakespeare, eventually published as The Shakespearean Ciphers Examined. Ooh, I know. It's a good title. It won awards from the Folger Shakespeare Library and the American Shakespeare Theater and Academy. Elizabeth would live to the age of 88, and she passed away in 1980 in New Jersey. Time magazine writes that, quote, While William Friedman was considered during his lifetime to be America's leading cryptologist and is remembered today as the godfather of the National Security Agency, Elizabeth's achievements have only received greater recognition in recent years. After World War II, records detailing her role were declassified. In fact, the Shakespeare Project, which Elizabeth had first encountered as a young woman in 1916, now seems like a minor side project compared to her other achievements. End quote. Jason Fagan writes that, She was a hero and she never got her due. And she was this amazing, hidden woman behind so many important secret battles of the 20th century. His book, The Woman Who Smashed Codes, a true story of love, spies, and the unlikely heroine who outwitted America's enemies, serves as the basis for a new PBS documentary called The Codebreaker, which uses archival letters and photographs to provide an inside look at Friedman's life and work. It's part of a renewed interest in Friedman's legacy in recent years. In April 2019, a Senate resolution was passed in her honor. And in July 2020, the U.S. Coast Guard announced that a new ship will be named after her. Fagan says she got written out of the history books. Now, that injustice is starting to be reversed. It's so interesting. And just to be clear, she was no assistant. Full stop. It is so interesting to look at projects that are collaborative. And I usually look at that from an, in an artistic standpoint. So films, photographs, writing, what have you. You get to experience it from a technology standpoint and see who gets credit. And there are times where I think – you know, for example, I've been in writer's groups and you're like, hey, I wrote this chapter and I'm having an issue and someone gives you an idea, then you write it. The agreement in the writer's group is that is now still your piece and they are assisting you for your benefit. Yeah. I love that about artists. Yeah. At the same time, there are teams where you have people who do so much work and it could not have been possible without them. They may have even led the team. Mm -hmm. Um. And they don't get any credit. And especially in a case like this, the credit could have done so much good. Right. It's like we said, if she had been given credit and it had been made known that a woman could do this, other women would have known they could do it. But of course, when it comes to the patriarchy, well, then that puts power in the hands of women when men really just want them to sit at home and take care of the kids while they have all the power. So for many reasons, I can see why people like J. Edgar Hoover would squash down all of her success. 
because it doesn't make them look good that a woman was the one to solve all of this. But it is so deeply, deeply frustrating. And it's things that are held over today that women in STEM still feel. My personal experience with collaborating with a lot of women and the girls, the gays, and the days in general is that people in that community are very quick to kind of do the like, oh, well, bouncing off what Tracy said or, Mm -hmm. you know, Tracy said this and I'm going to add this little detail, like very quick to give credit. Yes. And then to make sure they establish that before they continue. And I think that's a like a daily practice that comes from things like this. Absolutely. I think it comes from people who are in whatever way they are, you know, othered, Mm -hmm. having to do a lot more self-reflection than people Mm -hmm. who are considered the norm. Mm. So let's talk about women in STEM today. Oh, she's doing it. Oh, she's doing it. Go off. (laughs) (laughs) For those who don't know or who are just joining us, my day job is actually in technology. I am a manager in IT. And so this is a topic very close and near and dear to my heart. And I'm sure you're thinking, Rowan, obviously things have gotten so much better for women in technology than they were in the 1920s. No, just to be clear, I'm not thinking that. (laughs) Okay, good, good, good. All right. Well, good. We're on the same page. All right. So according to AAUW, which is an organization that focuses on improving diversity in the STEM fields, quote, Women make up only 28% of the workforce in science, technology, engineering, and math, and men vastly outnumber women majoring in most STEM fields in college. The gender gaps are particularly high in some of the fastest growing and highest paid jobs of the future, like computer science and engineering, in which only 16.5% are women. End quote. When I was graduating from college... There were, in my major, maybe six or seven women, max, myself included. All of the women knew each other. When I was graduating, could have named every single woman in my class easily. And I went to a big university. I've gotten the tea through Mm -hmm. all of this, right? I've (laughs) heard your stories. And I think... You say I could have. I, you, I think you did know every single woman. Absolutely. It, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there weren't that many of us. And um, <sighs> so, again, for those who don't know, I came into computer science and technology with no background in it. I was not that girl who coded. I was not that girl who was interested in it. In fact, I didn't think I was smart enough to do it. And my college roommate at the time was also in IT and showed it to me and would talk to me about it. And I switched really late in college, which is part of why I'm such a big believer in anyone can do technology. Anyone can learn it. And it is not a I'm smart enough or I'm not smart enough. But what really got to me in the beginning was there was a stereotype, and I think there still is, that women in in software development, especially in college, don't really work very hard and kind of rely on the guys to just do their work for them and don't really know how to do coding. And when I first joined the major, I didn't know anything, like anything about coding or anything. And so I hated that I kind of was this stereotype where I couldn't even Mm. clap back with, oh, well, I know so much more than you because I didn't know anything. And then um, by the time I graduated, I couldn't even walk in the hallways without people stopping me for tutoring help or asking questions. Like it was really satisfying to have that growth but I had people around me really supporting me through that and I think a lot of people and a lot of women don't or a lot of really anyone who's a woman or in the queer community anyone who's very uh clearly not a white man I think has had these experiences yeah and people of color it's just it's it's even harder for all of the same reasons that you mentioned just magnified plus some Absolutely. At 100% because the way that I explain it to people when I talk to them about this feeling is when you're a white guy in technology and you walk into the room and make a statement, everyone assumes the best of, of you. They assume you have the qualifications and you know what you're talking about. There's no doubt there. I, as a woman, have to prove myself first before people believe me. People of color have that tenfold. 
There was an amazing article titled Why So Few by AAUW, and in it they say, quote, One finding shows that when teachers and parents tell girls that their intelligence can expand with experience and learning, girls do better on math tests and are more likely to say they want to continue to study math in the future. That is, believing in the potential for intellectual growth in and of itself improves outcomes. This is true for all students, but it's particularly helpful for girls in mathematics where negative stereotypes persist about their abilities. By creating a growth mindset environment, teachers and parents can encourage girls' achievements and interests in math and science. Does the stereotype that boys are better than girls in math and science still affect girls today? Research profiled in this report shows that negative stereotypes about girls' abilities in math can indeed measurably lower girls' test performance. Research also believes that stereotypes can lower girls' aspirations for science and engineering careers over time. Most people associate science and math fields with male, and humanities and arts fields with female, according to research examined in this report. Implicit bias is common, even among individuals who actively reject these stereotypes. This bias not only affects individuals' attitudes towards others, but may also influence girls' and women's likelihood of cultivating their own interest in math and science. Taking the implicit bias test can help people identify and understand their biases so that they can work to compensate for them, end quote. And for anyone curious, I did leave a link to the implicit bias test in the show notes. There are a few different ones. There's social, educational, a few different types of bias tests that you can take. That's what you were telling me that we have to do. Yes. Together. Besties who implicit bias test together stay together. Stay together. together. <laughs> I think it's really important to, to highlight in this article. I was someone who thought I wasn't smart enough or wasn't good enough to get into STEM. I was someone who avoided math like the plague. And it wasn't until I worked really hard to develop a growth mindset that I felt I was able to really succeed in this field. And this field really taught me to have a growth mindset. So instead of saying I am smart or I am good at this or I am bad at that, it's I have the ability to learn. It's not that I'm bad at math or I'm good at math. It's that I don't know it yet and that I haven't learned it yet. Or it's harder for me to get through, but not impossible. That is a mindset that has really, really helped me because I've learned to get really grateful for failures because it was mm -hmm. a chance to learn. And the way that I see failures is that I'm really glad they happen. And the reason I'm glad they happen is because I think of it as great. I got it over with. Whatever that failure was, I did it. I learned from it. I won't do it again. And it's over with. I did it. And it's done. And it doesn't have to happen again. And so that makes me then grateful for the failures because, well, it could have been worse if it happened in the future, but it happened now. And I've learned. And it was really important for me to, to kind of convert to that learning and growth mindset. Yeah. And to Tracy's credit, she, you, I Hi. have been a big part of me adopting a growth mindset. And that happened a lot during college because uh, I was in kind of a very different environment than Tracy was, but we talked, obviously. Um, but I have an obsession with language. And and part of my trouble with that is there in a lot of ways, naming something defines it. And so I get wrapped up into what something is mm -hmm. or consequently what I am. And that is very much the opposite of a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And so, like, to what Tracy is saying, I'm not even in STEM, and I benefit from the work that she's doing to be a woman in STEM who thinks differently. And that's, yeah. like, a, an interesting trickle-down effect Yeah, to see. it is. It's like, um, you know, our STEM experience, just like it's our therapist. Right, right. But my <laughs> personal experience mm -hmm. and stuff. Truly, Rowan, if I can just read you that whole article, I would, but it's like 100 pages. So uh, it is linked in the show notes if anyone is interested, but it was really, really fascinating. The next thing I want to talk about is the pay gap. So I pulled a table from Forbes to show the pay disparity between men and women in STEM fields. And keep in mind, this is from around 2017, so the starting salaries are much higher than what you see here, 
but I wanted to highlight it because there are some really interesting factors in this chart. We'll have this on the Instagram for anyone who's listening. This sucks, Trace. (laughs) So you'll note computer and information sciences has the largest gap in pay between men and women, roughly $7,000 or 13% difference. And at the bottom of the list, the healthcare fields has a $298 or around a 1% difference in pay. I just really quickly want to contextualize this in a slightly different way because you can be like, oh, it's only 13% or, oh, it's only $7,000. $7,000 is uh, what you could contribute to your IRA plus some. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of money that helps people in the future. That is the kind of money that allows people to be a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more flexible, a little bit more, a little bit less afraid. Right. It adds up. And these numbers are bigger now. They're even bigger now than they were five, six years ago. And according to Ananya Astana, the founder and president of Women in STEM, an organization focused on bringing more women into STEM, quote, since March of 2017, we have been developing duly driven approaches in which we tackle both the attitudes surrounding women in STEM and also the limited opportunities available in high school, especially for girls. The gender disparity in STEM fields has been widely recognized, but few initiatives have been established at a younger age when girls decide what they want to pursue, end quote. We STEM offers coaching, mentoring, networking, and a whole host of other projects to begin to bridge the gap of women in STEM. We've linked their website in our show notes for anyone who's interested. I'm so passionate about this group because I'm someone who uses my free time through my job and other organizations to try to teach women about computer science and coding. And one of my favorite things we did is we went to an elementary school and we set up booths with different activities and we had one, which is very relevant to today, where we had some basic ciphers, like ones that are kind of the ones you start out with, like the pigeon cipher and things that are very commonly known. Mm -hmm. And we had all of the people at the event, like all the, you know, elementary school age girls come up and they had to solve the ciphers. And then they could reveal a hidden message. Um, Another table had beads that represented different uh, elements in binary. And so they could spell out secret messages in these colored bracelets. (gasps) I want a binary bracelet. I will find a way to get you a binary bracelet. That's so cute. It was so cute. It was so fun to see the ways that they engaged and learned and to talk about them and talking to like an eight-year-old girl who's like telling you what she wants to do and she's talking about being an engineer. Oh, mm. so cool. It, you know, like people learn skills when you make it worthwhile for them to learn them, when you make it exciting. Like I remember as a very, very little kid being so stressed out about typing. Yeah. Like I would panic. And then as soon as typing became the way that I communicated with my friends. Mm-hmm. I type like a wizard now. Like, as soon as you make it a way to connect, a way to expand, do something you couldn't do before. Or take away the judgment out of it, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that, I mean, what, are we, how many episodes are we in now? Like 87? How many skills did we have to learn to be able to do this? God, so many. (laughs) (laughs) So, for anyone interested in learning any more about all of this, please check out the links in our show notes. Hey, hi. hi. You can have a nemesis if you want one. Really? You can do it. I believe in you. I do too. I think you're worth it and you're able to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that was the life and work of Elizabeth Friedman. You did it. Thank you. I did it. Throw that in the face of anyone who thinks that our podcast has no science, uh, no tech. Y- oh, yeah. No, no substance. We're just two silly women who just talk about silly women things. Silly goofy gals. Just girl stuff. Just, hashtag just girly things. Hey, Tracy, tell me something good. All right. My something good is that I have been doing a wheel-throwing pottery class. Are there ghosts? Ugh. I'm sorry. I like Everyone uh, has to make the joke. Everyone you know what? has to make a joke. But I'm asking in earnest. <laughs> no, there are no ghosts. Although it is at a um, really, really old studio and it's it's a really cool location. Like the glazes are from like the 70s. And, like, no one knows the recipes anymore. 
like so a sourdough like, starter yeah <laughs> that's like exactly <laughs> it <laughs> it's crazy so it's so fun it's i just love learning a new skill um the teacher is this a wonderful woman who makes this like awesome work she's like super young and fun and we just chit chat and sh- and she's just lovely so um it's been really really fun and i like learning a new skill so my something good is pottery class throwing on the wheel is so fun it's a, so a fun. really it's so cathartic. hard yeah yeah it's a whole body activity people don't realize yeah but it, there's so many steps to it but it is just yeah it's so cathartic it's really really fun i i am loving it um been really really cool to do and to just see and to just like be bad at something and try it and keep learning like i just love it it's the growth mindset yeah yeah uh contrarily i dated a guy in high school because he went to a private arty school and and focused on pottery and i wanted to have my ghost moment and pretty much after i did that was the end of that you knew what you wanted you got in you got out (laughs) (laughs) all right rowan it's your turn Tell me something good. My something good. Uh, anybody who sees any video or picture of this is going to and and knows me from streaming or anything knows that I'm in Kaylee Bray's house right now uh, where she streams. Uh, she's been on this podcast uh, for the Bluebeard two part episodes, which was so good. Um, I adore Kaylee so much. So it'd be go listen to those episodes if you haven't. Bluebeard with Kaylee Bray. She is a goddess among us mortal men. She's a fantastic producer and just has a wonderful brain. But specifically, my something good this week is the fact that Kaylee is like peak kind of friend where she'll invite me over and be like, hey, do you want to come over and not talk? Hey, do you want to come over and be in the same space and get some work done? You want to just come over and read a book? Uh... And we won't talk. And it's so great. And Or she'll invite me over lately to come to the pool. And again, we just relax in each other's Mm -hmm. spin. And occasionally we'll chat for a minute and then we'll go back. I love that. That's what you need. I mean, I felt like we had that in high school. A lot lot of our friends would just sit in silence together. And then as adults, it feels like there always needs to be activities. Yeah, well, you and I do that a fair bit. Um, Except now we see each other so infrequently that when we are physically together, it's a lot of, like, working together. Right. It is also a lot of giddiness. Yes. <laughs> but we do have video calls where we have long stretches of silence where both of us are separately working on podcast stuff, but just kind of office hours-ing together. We actually should do that more because truly we get more work done that way. We um, do. We do. <laughs> but I also get more work done when I get to hang out quietly with Kaylee so get Mm -hmm. yourself a friend who's like hey I love you let's not talk yes (laughs) for 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 us introverts for extroverts maybe that's not like your vibe I don't know get on that vibe (laughs) (laughs) um yeah oh and hey one last little word if you're drifting off to sleep I hope you have sweet dreams I hope you have the best dreams. I hope you have the kind of dreams that inspire you when you wake up to create art or a story or at least just like a really cool dream you can tell your friends. And if you can't tell your friends, you can tell us about your cool dreams. But no matter what, thank you for joining us today. And remember, stories grow with the telling. So if you like what we do, tell a friend. Or tell your nemesis. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us for the Willing and Fable podcast. This episode was written and produced by Tracy Harrison and Rowan Hall. That's me. Our music was written and performed by Taylor Ash, and our logo is by Jamie Harrison. If you ever want to watch or read what we're reading, head over to willingandfable.com for our show notes and custom merch. Or find us at Willing and Fable on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to join the discussion. We hope you'll rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast using your favorite listening source. And check out Willing and Fable on Patreon, where we have more than a few surprises for you, including custom artwork, stories, and access to our secret Discord channel. And of course, 
Join us next time for another round of original retellings and in-depth research on the history, mystery, and mythology that makes the world so fascinating. Cryptologist looks... The cryptologist looks at Shakespeare. <laughs>